The second speaker, Rolando Gonzalez Jose, is principal investigator at the Patagonian Institute of Human and Social Sciences of the CONICET in Puerto Madryn, Argentina. Rolando received his PhD in biological anthropology in 2003 and at the University of Barcelona in Spain. And currently he's the director of the National Patagonian Center for Research, CENPAT, a large research institution, including more than 500 researchers and students. In 2004, he created the Human Evolutionary Biology Research Group, gathering biologists, anthropologists, bioinformaticians, and geneticists. Their results were published in top journals such as Nature and PNAS, and his research is focused on the evolution of modern human cosmopolitan Latin American populations, with emphasis on the genetic and non-genetic variation as a way to reinforce the public health system's capacities in precision medicine and population genomic medicine. He won several national prizes for his work. Well, thank you very much. Is it okay, the slide presentation? Yes. Uh, now. Yes. yes. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of life science across the globe and particularly to Alberto and Gabriel for inviting me uh, for this kind invitation. I will talk about science and human rights in, in our country and how these two dimensions cooperated in the past and cooperate in, in present. Um, as some of you know, in our country, the constitutional order was interrupted by six different military strikes since the beginning of the 20th century. The last one established a regime including a neoliberal, neoliberal economic model and a very bureaucratic and authoritarian state. In fact, during the dictatorship that ruled Argentina between 1976 and 1983, the military deployed a violent repression and enormous violations of human rights, including the forced disappearance of political dissidents. Records about the repressive legacy of the military juntas are eloquent. An estimated 30,000 people disappeared, thousands of political prisoners were tortured, murdered, and exiled, and pregnant women were also tortured and delivered their babies in humiliating circumstances in military barracks or hospitals, uh, only to be murdered uh, shortly after delivery. In virtually all of the cases, the children were raised with their true identity suppressed, completely suppressed. Many of these crimes were prosecuted by the judiciary, judiciary system in the most significant 1985 uh, trial, the Juicio de las Juntas, uh, that confirmed the responsibilities in the atrocities perpetrated. These crimes were widely denounced by human rights organizations and are reported in a landmark book, the Nunca Mas, meaning Nevermore in Spanish, which is the compilation made by the Argentinian Truth Commission in 1984. The trial was the first of its type in Latin America, and it was quite significant in political and social terms for it proved, publicized it, and punished the crimes of the dictatorship. And forensic evidence, especially the skeletal analysis presented by bioanthropologists Clyde Snow, uh, among others, were determinant during the trial since they demonstrated important particularities of the prosecuted crimes. For instance, the skeletal analysis presented during the trial demonstrated that the remains of many women such as uh, Liliana Carmen Pereira, this photo here, uh, presented morphological traits in the tables compatible with recent delivery in combination with marks of violent death in uh, her skull, for instance. So to sum up, such bioanthropological evidence showed that pregnant women delivered their babies during their captivity and then were murdered. Nevertheless, in the following years and under strong military pressure, this human rights policy was interrupted by two laws during the Alfonsin presidency uh, and two decrees of executive pardon signed by President Menem uh, at the end of the 80s. These laws and decrees attempted to close 
uh, the matter of past human rights violations, promoting a policy of reconciliation. The political processes that uh, led the way out of the crisis from 2003, when Nestor Kirchner was elected president, introduced relevant changes in both sides of this tale. In one hand, a renewed Supreme Court of Justice abolished the pardon laws, a decision that triggered the restarting of trials uh, all across the country, uh, with human rights organizations playing a key role in all this new trials. On the other hand, the scientific institutions in our country experienced significant transformations that improved the work conditions in general. So despite the fluctuating policies uh, in our democratic period regarding the prosecution of crimes during the last dictatorship, human rights movements were a stable factor since the late 70s until today. The grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, Abuelas in Spanish, Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, for instance, is an organization with the goal of finding the children stolen and illegally adopted during the last dictatorship. The organization was, found in, in, was founded in 1977 and the president since then is Estela de Carlotto, which is this woman here, photographed in the 70s. So let's go some, to some demographic estimation. Demographic estimations indicate that around 30% of the disappearing persons were women. And of those women, around 3% were pregnant. So far, the abuelas have received reports regarding the disappearances of 255 children, 71 of them kidnapped, and 131 having been born in imprisonment. During the grandmother's obstinate journey around the world, they sought to discover if a specific genetic method existed to determine child kinship in the absence of his, his or her parents. Many scientific centers were consulted by the abuelas uh, uh, at the final part of the, of the military government and the first part of, the, of our democratic period until Dr. Fred Allen from the Blood Center of New York allowed them to carry this genetic studies. Valuable support was also provided by a key person in, in all this story, which is Dr. Victor Penchasade, an Argentinian geneticist exiled in the state at that moment, who contacted the abuelas with doctors Mary Clark King and Christian Orrego from the University of California at Berkeley. With their help, they developed a specific blood analysis method that predicts kinship with 99.9% uh, probability. The result of this study is called the Grand Parenting Index, which is a reference parameter of key importance in the determination of disappearance children's identity, true identity. So a first take home message here. We could argue that in the very beginning of the prosecution of dictatorship crimes, scientific evidence was of key importance to demonstrate violation of human rights in Argentina. These testimonies, these initial contacts among the human rights world and scientific institutions can be considered as the origin of the Argentine anthropologic forensic team and the National Genetic Data Banks, two examples of about how the initial cooperation among science and human rights organizations derived on the creation of novel institutions into our scientific landscape, institutional landscape. Let's go to the, to the case of the Genetic Data Bank. The National Genetic Data Bank was created by a national act in, in uh, 19, 87, to guarantee the possibility for children kidnapped by the last dictatorship to recover their identity. The grandmothers, along with other governmental institutions, drafted a bill proposing a genetic data bank of relatives of disappeared children. This bill was submitted to, to, as a priority to parliament by President Alfonsin and then ratified in a national act in, in uh, 1987. 87. This act allowed to establish the conditions that enable the identification of the grandchildren, even if the abuelas are no longer present. 
since it is impossible to know when they will be located. Since 2009, the National Genetic Data Bank is under the orbit of the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, and it is responsible for the storage and preservation of the blood samples of each of the members of the family groups and to fa facilitate future studies and present determinations. The bank is now under the direction of Dr. Mariana Herrero Herrera Piñero, a geneticist, a geneticist formerly in integrating CONICET and, and University of Buenos Aires. And currently, genetic testing is based on the analysis of 15 microsatellites, complemented when needed with mitochondrial DNA analysis. For those cases in which the parents are absent and only distant relatives are available, such as paternal, maternal grandparents, siblings, half siblings, cousins, aunts, and or uncles, it is possible to also analyze microsatellites in the Y chromosome. In cases where the sisters of the absent mother or a possible maternal grandmother are available, it is possible to analyze the maternal lineage through mitochondrial DNA sequences. In conclusion, by studying a large number of microsatellites, either from non-sex chromosomes or from sex chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA, one can obtain kinship probabilities that are high enough to confirm a biological link on a judiciary perspective, legal judiciary perspective. Of course, people at the bank perform research, developed research. Um, let's see a recent example. Uh, in cases with few available relatives, exhumations of graves or other substantial efforts may be necessary in order to secure adequate statistical power. So the question arises about how to prioritize relatives of the missing person in order, in order to obtain samples for the genetic analysis. This is a kind of forensic research question, questions that concern the bank scientists. In this paper, for instance, the authors estimate the statistical power of each alternative, both to detect the true person and to exclude false candidates. They present a useful method to unravel complex prioritization problems and other power related questions. This is of particular importance in some recent cases uh, where only children of, of the potential match are available for testing. So far, the bank has been fundamental in connecting 150 children who were illegally appropriated after their parents, parents were disappeared to their biological families. It has also allowed other individuals to identify family members who went missing after the end of the dictatorship. In every occasion, when a grandchildren is detected and introduced to his or her biological family, many people in our country feels an enormous emotion. And many of us also feel that the abuela's claim for memory, truth, and justice is stronger than ever. In conclusion, the bank has, has been key in upholding the right to identity in our country. Let's go to the second example, uh, which is the Argentina Forensic Anthropology Team. With the restoration of, the, of democracy in 1983, Argentina embarked on a process of exhumations of the many unmarked graves found in the country on the belief that uh, many of them could contain unidentified victims of forced disappearances. Specific scientific methods then were needed. And in this context, it was created the uh, Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team. This is a non-profit, non-governmental scientific organization. It was created in 1986 at the initiative of several human rights organizations with the aim of developing developing forensic anthropology techniques to help locate and identify the Argentines who had disappeared during the last dictatorship. Since then, the team members have conducted fieldwork on 30 countries, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, Angola, Timor-Leste, French Polynesia, Croatia, and South Africa, among others. The cases are pinpointed in this, in this map. In particular, the team acquired uh, additional renown by identifying the remains of Ernesto Che Guevara found in Bolivia in 1997. 
The EF methods can be divided into three basic stages that they apply, apply to, to every case. A preliminary phase, collecting written and oral accounts of the disappeared persons. A second analysis phase, studying documents and records in order to identify the possible whereabouts of the remains. And an archaeological phase, uh, which is a, a classical uh, uh, archaeology excavation within a forensic, forensic context. This phase also uses genetic techniques, of course, based on DNA testing. Um, research, um, recent research led by the EAF scientists include computation developments aimed to develop prioritizing algorithms in cases of a mass disaster via, for instance, Bayes Bayesian approaches and complex networks, among other uh, approaches. Uh, here I have listed some recent papers by them. In terms of new technologies, the aim is to incorporate the forens to the forensic practice non-conventional disciplines or methods. Technologies such as remote sensing, LIDAR, georadars, multispectrometry, and hyperspectrometry, among others, are widely used in agronomy, space research, archaeology, for instance, but their benefits to forensic practice are evident and are being included into the work of the EF. A final note, a final comment on a very recent news on the topic of connection among science and human rights organizations. Uh, last Friday, CONICET signed an agreement with, it, with the Grandmothers Association in order to improve the preservation, indexation, digitization, and promotion of the Abuelas Enormous and Rich Archives, which cover familial and institutional documents. Uh, and under this agreement, several research groups will help to organize documents, including letters, correspondence, publications in several areas such as biographic files, generic data, photograph of uh, missing persons, and institutional documents. Uh, noticeably, one of the principal researchers is also one of the many re-identified grants. So I'm talking about Dr. Jorge Castro Rubel, who will be participating in, in, in the context of this agreement. So the final conclusion of this talk is that uh, the synergy among scientists and human rights organization, a mutual effort uh, sustained du during more than four decades, derived on the creation of novel mission-oriented scientific institution. These institutions are relevant not only to unravel past crimes, but also to generate the conditions on the young scientist community for a strong commitment with human rights and service. This synergistic collaboration can uh, also inspire similar efforts in other countries that suffered institutional violence and crimes against humanity during their recent history. And of course, a lot of work is still to be done in this, in this topic. Um, to those interested in, in more details regarding uh, science and human rights cooperation, uh, are invited to read Gen uh, Genetica y Derechos Humanos, Genetics and Human Rights, a very complete book edited by the prominent scientist and human rights activist, Victor Penchasat. And that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Rolo. Uh, a great talk on the synergy between science and human rights. And I must say, I learned a lot about forensic anthropology and the techniques employed. So um, let me ask you this. The, uh, you talked about the Argentinian forensic anthropology team uh, working in three phases. So the preliminary phase of collecting records, the analysis phase of studying documents and digging a little deeper, and finally, using a genetic approach during the actual archaeological phase of trying to connect the dots of the, who the remains belongs to. So in your experience, what has been the most challenging uh, step in this process? This is a very interesting question. I, I, I would say that I'm not part of the uh, uh, Argentine anthropologic forensic team, but in conversations with my colleagues of the team, I, I am convinced that the, the most difficult part is the first one the preliminary phases. And I will explain you why I think that. This is because it depends strongly on the politi political uh, the, the, the political decision to reinforce the teamwork 
and the collaborate and the local collaborations of the collaborators of the team. If um, political conditions is a, if a political framework of cooperation and of supporting the work of the team is is clear and is well established, then I think that the remain part of the work, the, the rest of the work will flow in a, in a natural way and significant results will be obtained. But if uh, there is a lack of political support to, uh, to the work, uh, in my view, it is very difficult to obtain uh, the, the, the data relevant to prosecute crimes. Ah, thank you. So here's a second question for you. So has this effort helped to change the public perception of science and support for science? Definitely, yes. Yes. Um, you know, in, in many Latin American countries, the po political cycles uses uh, when they, they adopt neoliberal politics, they use to, to, to promote cutoff on scientific budgets. When we, Argentinian scientists, uh, explain to the community that science can be at the service of human rights organizations and to uncover the most dark parts of our recent history, then the community feels committed with us. And uh, I am convinced that uh, young scientists um, felt in love again with their disciplines and feel parts of a largest community, which is connecting with the most important uh, goals as a nation, as a community, as a society that, that we can have, that is um, uh, rewrite the, the most dark parts of our, of our history. So yes, I, I am convinced about that. Wow, that's, that's indeed a great impact and uh, must be very rewarding. So, all right, here's a third question for you. Uh, and we circle back to the techniques and approaches. Um, so, you employ genetic approach here, right? A DNA based approach. But what are the other methods that a forensic anthropology study could generally use? I know you kind of touched upon this in one of the slides, but could you please elaborate on some of the techniques that could possibly be used? Yes. Well, in general terms, forensic anthropology can, can copy the, the advances that uh, bioanthropology in general, anthropological biology in general experience. For instance, the using of, of medical images such as uh, CT scans, um, um, MRI, uh, applied to, uh, to skeletons uh, found in, in, in forensic context uh, uh, are now to be used and, and are used in the in the in in some recent cases. Um, it is very interesting the the connection with uh, computation computation sciences, as I have mentioned it, uh, in order to enhance prior prioritizing uh, algorithm. This is of particular importance in case in cases of mass disasters uh, uh, into the forensic context. Um, I think that many developments uh, are coming from computation sciences uh, with ap uh, applications into the, the prioritizing algorithms. All right, so many approaches could lead to more interesting discoveries. So here's, uh, I, I would like to say probably the last question of the day. And this comes to us from Professor Jito Mayer. What is the current political framework and the extent of support for the work of uh, EAAF? And does this keep changing with the different governments? Oh, it's a very interesting question. I, I, um, we could separate the two. Uh, the, the question is, is focused on the, on the EAF. But if we see, if we see the, the case of the National Genetic Data Bank, the, uh, the detail that it is created and protected by a law uh, is is uh, it it's an, under the orbit, orbit of a of a um, of a ministry uh, brings to the bank a kind of stability of, uh, in their in their daily work. Uh, regarding the EF, um, I think that the the prestige of the team has enabled them to 
seen a lot of, of uh, a network of agreements with uh, institutions, uh, government institutions such as CONICET, for instance, or, or the bank itself, the generic bank itself, that bring the Argentinian anthropological team a kind of stability too, in a different way. Uh, however, uh, these are scientific institutions. They are not free of, of the phenomena that I, will, I was talking about some, some minutes ago. Uh, if, if a neoliberal political term, term uh, came into, into our country, it is highly predictable that uh, scientific budgets will be, will be cut, will be reduced. So, uh, the, to me, that is, a, is a, the, true, the true problem. But in a way, we can see those institutions as, as with a certain degrees of stability due to their traditions, due to their prestige into the community. So uh, I think uh, we, can, we, can, we can be calm regarding this. All right, um, interesting. Thank you, Rolo. Uh, and I guess with that, I am afraid we are running out of time. So we will have to be closing the session. So uh, on behalf of um, all of us here in Janelia, I would like to thank our participants today. Thanks, Alberto, for introducing the speakers. Thanks to our speakers, Gabrielle and Rolando, for the great insightful presentation and uh, for also engaging in a very interesting discussion session, which we would love to continue. Uh, so audience, please make sure you join the Slack channel. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, our audience today for joining us and for engaging in the discussion. Next week, Life Sciences Across the Globe will be hosting our sister institute, MRC, um, Lab of Molecular Biology. And we will hear from Jason Chin and Chris Russo. So please mark your calendars, do join us. And in the meantime, goodbye from us, be safe.